Okay, let, uh, let's continue. So, uh, because actually just go back a, a, a few steps. So we start with uh, an integral, which we call uh, a functional. So you have J that is uh, integral that depends on integrating a function F this F has uh, depends on Y, which is uh, a function of X, and then part, uh, dy dx, which we call it Y sub X. And the X itself, in general, it can depend on all three. It can depend on higher derivatives also, but we, we stop at here first. And the X integrating from, this is X1 to X2. Right, so now our goal is to get the condition for a optimal value of j. So we do a, a uh, variation of j. But uh, since uh, y is a function, so y basically do a variation is y goes to y plus delta y. But uh, delta y is also a function of x, so it becomes a unfamiliar, you can uh, to take a derivative of j with respect to delta y, seems like an unusual concept. So what, uh, what we do is just uh, first introduce a parameter alpha times a function, okay? And we require that uh, the function eta and then delta y is zero at the boundary. So we don't vary the boundary. So like a to x1 equals a to x2 equals to zero. So that's the uh, basic case. If you were let it vary, there'll be a complication to the equation, which uh, we won't talk about right now, but uh, you can look up the a more general book on the, calculus of variation to, to talk about those cases. But uh, we stop in here. So now if you use that, uh, now y becomes a, uh, there's a variable alpha that you can take derivative. So what we'll do is uh, take the derivative of j with respect to alpha. So j d alpha will be just, because they are alpha in, inside the uh, integram, so we can take the derivatives. So what we do is uh, using the chain rule, because uh, uh, they are alpha here, alpha here. There's no alpha in X, because X is uh, just the integration variable. So you have partial F, partial Y as uh, taking partial derivative with respect to this argument. And then we take the derivatives of the y with respect to alpha, which we will get give you this, this term. So we'll, we'll take the derivative with respect to alpha, you just get eight out. Okay, so that's with respect to this one. And then there's a second term, which is partial f, partial y sub x. This one, right? And then we take the take the derivative with respect to uh, y sub x, which uh, we just take one more derivative over this uh, equation. So delta y x would be because alpha is just a constant as a parameter. Right. So we take the derivative of. Uh, y x you get with respect to alpha you get a to x a to x which is a d a to d x right so that's uh, that's up to here and then what we do with respect to this part is that uh, we do an integration by parts so x two let's just write this separately because uh, well. 
maybe we write uh, integration by part this term out because this one doesn't involve integration by parts. That's why we we'll, we'll do integration by parts. So uh, what we have is uh, because this is d a to d x right, so we can write it a to and then partial f partial y sub x evaluate at x one to x two, right, and then we subtract the uh, subtract uh, subtract the derivative of, of this the whole thing, right? Subtract the derivative of this is a to uh, partial partial a to right. So we need to take the derivative over this one. Okay, so so the the second term is my, there's a minus sign, but we we write this term first. So we have x one x two, and then you have this partial f y a to And then uh, minus eta, and then derivative of this one with respect to x. Now, uh, because this is an integration in x, so we need the d d x over partial f partial y x, and then uh, we can pull the both have eta. Actually, we can pull the eta out. Okay, so that is uh, the integration by part. But up once in this step, uh, we need to introduce the concept of these total derivatives because uh, this is a function f. Although f depends on three variables, so x and then y, y as a function of x and then dy dx as a function of x. But uh, once we express everything in terms of x, the whole function f just depends on x. So we can take the total derivative, but uh, this total derivative uh, of f has three, uh, you can separate it in three terms because there's an explicit dependency of x here. There's a dependence of x through y and dependency of x through dy dx. So this total derivative, we need to uh, separate in, in three terms. So one is uh, partial partial x, which is respect to the explicit argument of x, and then plus the uh, uh, x dependence is through y, so you have partial partial y, and then take the according to the chain rule, take the derivative of y with respect to x, so you have y dy dx would be equal y sub x. Okay, and then the third term is uh, dependency on x through this term, so you have partial partial y sub x, and then do the derivative x derivative over y y sub x, which is a second derivative. Okay, so this is what, uh, what it means by a total derivative, and this is going to here. We take the total derivative over here. So whatever this function is, you put it into here and here and here. Okay, that's how you, you calculate this, this operation. This ddx is not just partial partial x, it's not just with respect to this well. Okay, so that is, uh, you need to be careful. So that's, that's DDX. Now, uh, we can write it in the variation form because we can define the variation that the J is DJ D uh, alpha and then delta alpha, right? All right, so, uh, so we can multiply by this through this, this, just this multiply by delta alpha, which is uh, just basically just alpha because uh, we're changing delta, uh, delta y as, uh, as, 
a function of alpha, right? So, so this is basically a parameter and then basically we can change alpha to delta alpha. So basically this multiplied by eta will give you delta y. And uh, first of all, this is, this is zero, but this is zero, the bounded term. So we multiply delta alpha to here. It says a parameter, so we multiply by here and then go back to delta y, okay? This is just another way to write the uh, integral or the derivation. Uh, the idea is that uh, we want to go back to delta y instead of eta. Now this is delta y. Okay, the reason why we go back to delta y is that eta is a fixed function Remember what we talked about, uh, so x, y, from x1 to x2. So you have a curve, any curve by fixing the boundary term. So you vary just the interior, so you get a function, delta y, add to this y, so maybe something like that. So, so this is y. And this is y plus delta y. Okay, so it's where we with respect to a given function y, but fix the endpoint, so we don't worry the endpoint. So the there, so for this particular curve, you have that one a there, but this is what just one way to worry it. You can worry it any other way. So you can by the other way you will worry it this way. You can do it like this. So that would be another a there. Okay. So this step, this one go to here, is valid for all different eta. Any eta that's subject to some smoothness condition, that is still this is still this is still valid. Okay. But uh, this is just for one given eta. But uh, when you multiply alpha again, this is delta y. So any delta y is you need to satisfy this equation. And it, no matter how you vary it, uh, as long as you keep the endpoint, this is this is still the same. Okay? Because we use the endpoint condition to cancel the boundary term, this is still the same. And the condition for a maximum or extremum J is that the derivation is zero. Okay. Now this is a integration an integration is zero, doesn't necessarily mean that the integram is zero, but if the integram is valid, uh, is zero, the whole integral is zero for a integram, that is for arbitrary delta y, then this, whatever multiplying the delta y must be zero, okay, over the whole range of x. Okay, so that's, that's a mathematical theorem or, or lambda for that one, right? Because even just for one particular delta y, even if it's zero, it doesn't mean this is zero because this is an integral. But if for arbitrary delta y, this is still zero, then whatever multiply by, by this arbitrary function, arbitrary perturbation, this might, must be zero. Can you catch this one? This is the most critical point to understand, right? Because uh, you cannot see well, once you write an integral is zero, the integral must be zero. This, this is not correct. This is not uh, logical, uh, logically it's not correct, okay? But it's, if it is for an arbitrary delta y, then this must be zero, okay? So now this is the final result. So uh, we can write down this final result as uh, what we call, what is called the Euler equation in your, by, in your textbook, minus DDF. Dx function f function y sub x. Just this is the final result. The Euler equation or the Euler Lagrange equation. It's okay. So, so that is the final product for here. So this is uh, twenty-two point fourteen, and then. Uh, Obviously, you can generalize that to um, 
in a diff different direction, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, for, for a function f that depends on x and y and y sub x only, this is the equation. Okay, and if you have a y double prime, y of y double x, y sub x, x, or a second division of, of y in the integram, there will be a second term with partial f partial y sub x, x term. Okay, and those are, can be generalized uh, in a similar way. Okay, so, so that is this derivation. Okay, the derivation is not difficult. It's just that uh, um, there's just one possibility. So you use the same idea, whatever the, this function. So we will generalize that to different directions. So maybe F depends on not just X, maybe two variable X, Y, or, or multi, multi variable X, Y, Z, things like that in three dimension. Or maybe that depends on different function. It's just not just y and then another function. Okay. Or it depends on higher derivative, more than y sub x. Okay. So you can generalize it to different direction, but the same process just apply to you apply the same process and derive a variation in this form. So whatever that uh, the factor multiplied by arbitrary perturbation, mod, uh, arbitrary. Uh, variation in the function that must be zero and those are the, the equations that you, you need to you get out from this process okay so uh, so that is uh, that is the idea so but we'll use this uh, simple Euler Lagrange equation for some problem first to illustrate the process because now you just get the equation, you still need to solve the problem. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how, what you do. The process is just like that. The first example is just a very simple one. Uh, just to say that the, the sorted distance on the two dimensional plane, the curve that is a, uh, with the smallest distance between two points is a straight line. So that is just, uh, Trivial, okay. All right. So are we raise any question up here? How are we raise this? So now this is just now the an example, the very simple example. First we will start with this trivial example, then we we'll, we we'll get to one that is non-trivial, okay, and well, and quite interesting actually. Okay, so the trivial one is the just like if you have two dimensional plane, right? So you want to get, so you have an X, Y plane. No. Similar to this, you have a one point. So let's use your notation in your textbook, X sub one, X sub two, right? X one, X, X one, Y one. So this point, X one, Y one, and then go to X two. Y2, given these two points, so you want to find, find a curve. This curve, you can express it like a function, Y as a function of X, okay? And then you want to find the curve such that the, the, the length of this curve, basically the, the, the upper length, so you, you integrate it along the, this, function, this path, and calculate the, the length and find out the, what y as a function x will minimize this distance. Obviously, we all know that the answer is a straight line, but uh, we'll just uh, do it through the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay, so first we write down a j, a functional. Now, this, this is the path integral of the length, so it's uh, integrating v sub s uh, from x1 to x2. So basically this is, this is your d sub s to integrate from x1 to x2, integrate along this one, okay? This d sub s is just, uh, you probably learn about this thing in uh, 
calculus, so, so quite straightforward. So this is in terms of two two dimensions, just basically delta x squared plus delta y squared. Right. Uh, and we want to get to uh, I actually should not because this is uh, this is I just indicate I should just in, indicate endpoint. Right. And to get to integral in, in terms of x. We just pull out the dx out. So that becomes x1, x2. When you pull out the dx out, this becomes one. And this is just dy dx. Okay. So, uh, and then to compare with this one, you may you might want to just simplify your notation. This is written as y sub x. Yeah. Okay, so the first step is to, for this optimization problem, you write an integral in this form. Okay, so this is uh, written in this form because this is this is this will be your f. Okay, f is one plus y sub x square. Okay, all right. So in this case, uh, you can plug in the Euler Lagrange equation. So f. Let's write down explicitly f is plus y x square. Okay. So put in here. So the first thing you want is partial y, partial f partial y, but there's no y here. The partial f partial y is zero. Okay. The second thing is uh, this one partial f partial y sub x, which you have. So partial f partial y sub x is just this derivative. So you have one half and this derivative is going to the, this square we're going to this denominator and then two y x we cancel two. Okay, so you don't have this one. So, so the total Euler Lagrange equation is d dx, and then this factor, which is y x one plus y x square equals to zero. Okay, so, and of course, uh, to solve this is uh, quite trivial because when this uh, total derivative is zero, it means that this is a constant. Plus the constant. And the left hand side just depends on y sub x. And then the other is just this factor, this term of one. Okay. And it's just a single value function. If the whole function is, is a constant, it means that y sub x must be a constant. Okay. So y sub x is a constant. And different constant, of course, not the same constant, but the y sub x still need to be a constant. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I copy one, one left, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I forgot this square root. This, you're correct, so. But it's the same arg argument, still correct. So this is still a function of just y sub x. So y sub x is a constant. Okay, so that, that this means that uh, why this is a trivial question is that because the solution is straightforward. So this is dy dx is a constant. So dy dx in, in this case, uh, of course, uh, you can work that out quite in a quite straightforward way. So, but in terms of our parameters, the dy dx would be simply just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? And then 
using either one of these uh, value, you can find the functional form of of the of the y. So you can solve it. So y is so y two minus y one so minus x one times x plus uh, plus uh, another constant, whatever the constant is, such that uh, like you park in x one. This would be x y one, so c would be y one minus this one multiplied by x one. Okay, so so uh, I mean you can you can work 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 that out. Uh, okay, so that's the process. So you get a straight line out of this process, which uh, it just serve as an example because uh, that's you have a other much simpler argument to, to get the same result. Okay. Is there any questions? Just just a just a very straightforward um, application for the Euler Lagrange equation. Any question up to here? This is just a, a simple example. The next one would be more complicated. But before we do that, uh, uh, we want to get to the uh, the other form of the Euler equation uh, listed in your textbook. Okay, so. This is this form, and there's another form which is equivalent to this, which are in uh, equation 20.19, which is partial f, partial x minus b dx, f minus y, x, y sub x, and partial f. Also. Okay. So this is another form, and to see why this is so, uh, there's an exercise in the back of the chapter. But uh, since I'm not assigning exercise to you, this is just for your information. So I'll just uh, do it quickly. Uh, how why this is so, and to show that this is equivalent to this, you can just use this BDX or operate on this function. So this is just. F plus x minus it's df dx. The first thing is df dx you put in here. So what you have a partial f partial x and minus uh, y x partial f partial y minus y double x partial f partial y sub x. So that is df dx over here. Okay, and now the, the this dx on the second term, because there's two factor, you'd use the distribution rule. So this minus and minus become plus. So this operate on this factor first, you have y double x, also f, also y sub x. I may have to get the of the range. Okay, and then a second second term is uh, getting the derivative over this one. So it plus y x uh, d d x also f also y sub x. Okay, now you just cancel terms with this cancel with this one. And then this one is the same as this one, can see, right? And combine these two terms, this is y, x, right? Well, put the negative sign out. This is partial f, partial y, minus dx, partial f, partial y, x. And if this is zero, then this is zero. Okay, so, so this is just the, and, so called alternate form. And, but uh, you apply this form basically for the case that the f doesn't depend on x explicitly. It means that there's no x dependency here, only depends on y and y sub x. Okay. In that case, uh, if partial f partial x is zero, then the total derivative of this term is zero, meaning that uh, f minus is y sub x times partial y partial y sub x is. It's a constant, 
Okay, so that is an alternative form if, okay, let me write here. So I'm going to come back to here to, to get to the, to the next example. We we'll still have time to do that. Okay. So basically, partial f partial x is zero. Then the Euler Lagrange equation becomes a f minus y sub x partial f partial y sub the constant. Okay. So that uh, is simpler. In this case, compare this one with this one. This one is simpler, okay? And although the, you can still use this one if you don't want all this complication to, to get to a second equation, you can always only use this one and you will still get everything as long as you solve the equation correctly, okay? We will use this one for the second example. Now this example is a, uh, so called a, a uh, uh, what do you call soap, soap frame? Basically, uh, it's uh, although it's a three dimension problem, but then uh, it, it has this uh, rotation or as a move for symmetry. So you have this uh, on the xy frame first, it's this is y. X1 into X2. So on the location of X1, you have a circle that is uh, like perpendicular to the XY plane. So you have a circle. This is story, something like that. Okay. And this point is on this plane is X1, Y1. Right. And then you have another circle over here. So maybe different radius. And this point is uh, the top of this uh, on this plane is x2, y2, right? And this circle, these two circles are uh, perpendicular to the xy plane. So basically, like uh, if you are z direction, both of these circles are on this on the z uh, along the z z direction. Okay. And assuming these are y, uh, so you can have this. Uh, a soft frame between these two, two circles. And uh, you can like, uh, at first these two maybe is just put it together and then you pull it apart to X, X1 and X2 location. And then you will set up a frame between the two, two ring. Okay. And the idea is that this, area this, uh, should be a minimum value, okay? Because uh, of the surface tension, try to minimize the, the area, okay? So we basically, this is just a physical situation such that you can uh, set up a uh, optimization problem because now you want to minimize this, this area. This is an area, this is a surface area but there is a uh, area of uh, well, revolution because you, you're just going around this. This is the x-axis going around the x-axis in two pi. So you have this, the whole area, okay? So now the, you, you, get the, you get the physical situation, right? This, you can understand the, the geometry. Is it okay for everyone because this is, you did this to set up the, the integral, okay? Now the, the integral is the area. So in this case, because of the, the asymmetric symmetry, the area is just whatever is this, uh, you know, this ds, which is this length. So we set up the, to solve this function. This is your function y as a function x, which goes through two points y1, uh, x1, y1, and x2, y2. So this is a curve y as a function x. And the area is this uh, over a distance ds on the curve. 
Yeah, so did you, there's this uh, circular area. So the area would be this DA would be this, the, the radius, which is Y, right? And then the circumference would be two pi times Y and then multiply by DS. Right, you can get that this area, this little area on, on the surface of the frame is given by this one. Yeah, you all can, can get that, right? So uh, the two pi is not important because it's such a constant. We just want to min do a minimization. Okay, so J will be two pi times uh, integration for X1 to X2 and Y times DS, we already done DS. This is one for x square and x, right? Yeah. This is just the, what we did uh, for the straight line problem. Okay, so, so that is, this is just this one. All right. So, uh, so we'll now solve this uh, optimization problem. Again, we can use this one if you like, but uh, because the integram, so F is this one. So this is this is F now. Okay. F only depends on Y and Y, Y sub X, right? There's no X dependency. So we can use this function or this equation. Okay. So now we plug that in. So you have Y and then multiply by this. N plus y x square. And this is f. I mean, ignoring two pi, so the two pi is uh, unimportant, right? And then minus y x y sub x. And do this derivative, we, which we already did that before. So it's just uh, square root of one plus y sub x square, and then multiply by y sub x, which is would make this square. Okay, so that equals the zero, or equals the constant, so plus, plus equals the constant. Okay, now we can simplify this a little bit because uh, we can do a common denominator. And this is one plus one x square. And then you have, I forgot the y here. Wait, y x, there's a y in there, in this term. There's y x partial y, f partial y, y sub x, which is give you this one, but there's still a y here. Okay, so there's a y here. Okay, so you have a y coming out, and common denominator, you have one plus y sub x square, and minus y sub x square, so this two cancel. Okay. So, uh, so all together is y divided by this square root function equals to a constant. Okay. Now to solve it, uh, is we can write that as a, in a differential equation, and now that uh, let's see. We don't need that. Let's follow the textbook notation of this, what this constant is. I think this constant is called, uh, this is y divided by this equals to c sub one, which is a constant, okay? Now to solve this, following the, uh, this equation, Mm. We have, I mean, there are different way to solve this, but uh, a straightforward way is to get y, y, y sub x in terms of y, that in, in, in the form of a differential equation. So this is this equation, you can take a square, take a square, 
Uh, okay, if you solve this, so y x square would be uh, y square minus c sub one square divided by c sub one square or y x or dy dx, which is y x, y sub x is yes, just square root. There's a plus and minus sign because you're taking the square root, uh, square root of this function. C1, uh, because you have absolute value uh, in, I mean, you have plus and minus signs, so this is, you don't need to keep the absolute value in this. I mean, C1 can be negative, okay. But, uh, but this is your differential equation, right? So, in general, you can form the Euler Lagrange equation. You can get a differential equation for y. Usually, for this one, only depends on y sub x. You get a first order because you only have y sub x. You get a first order OD from, from this, uh, this process. Now, the test is to solve this uh, differential equation subject to the boundary condition. Now, you have this boundary condition. This y x would, would go through this two point. It looks like it is over determined, but uh, you have this uh, c sub one as uh, a extra parameter. So not just uh, for a given x c sub one, you choose a c sub one such that uh, this differential equation will have a solution that goes with this point and that point. Okay, so you have enough condition for you to solve the, the equation. Okay, so now uh, this equation looks like uh, a little difficult, but uh, if you know the answer, you can just uh, just guess the the form of the solution. Okay, because this uh, this looks like a um, I mean because you know the answer. It, this looks like the, you can looks like you can use the property of a, of the hyperbolic sine or hyperbolic sine function because uh, you know that the cos the function for functional form whatever function let's just use z cos z square minus c square z equals to one. But this is the property of uh, cosh and sinh, right? You know that uh, that's similar to sine and cosine. If you have sine, cosine, cosine square plus sine square is one, but uh, for sinh, cosh and sinh, you have a negative sign. Okay, now this this uh, this means that uh, you rearrange us the cosh minus one, which is sinh square, right? So you have a, if y is proportional cosh, and you minus a constant, take the square root, will give you sinh, but then uh, remember the cosh, the derivative of cosh is a sinh. Okay, so if y is proportional to cosh function, take the derivative, you give you a sinh function, right? And then uh, this square root will be like the square of this one, the square of this one will also give you a sinh, Okay, so that uh, that would give you a way to solve it. Uh, I mean, at least guess the solution. If you don't like this method, you solve it explicitly. You multiply dy, uh, divided this y square minus c1 here to the other side, and multiply dx to the other side. So the right hand side will in integrate to a x plus a constant, right? That uh, dy divided by this, you integrate that, you get the inverse cost function. Okay, so after this pause, you get exactly the same solution. Okay, so that suggests us to find a solution that is uh, uh, similar to this form, but uh, we need to do uh, some adjustment because there's a constant C1 here, so we cannot just use the cost function. So you can try Y 
is you have this C sub one here and cosh of uh, a uh, function of x, but uh, you can write it like not just x because you can add shift to origin. You can let's just say x minus a certain x sub zero. And you can also have a, a factor in front of this because uh, when you do the derivative of that, you not just keep this constant. You, when you do the derivative of cosh, you get the cinch, but then you, you take a derivative of the argument, so you get another function out. I mean, another constant out based on the, the scaling. And what you want is, uh, what you want is, this is a cinch because you substitute this into here, take the square root and cancel with this C sub one, you just, just cinch. But when you do dy dx, you get this C sub one. So you want to cancel this C sub one when you do the, when you do the C derivative. So obviously you want to divide it by C sub one here. Okay. Now, this is your guess, but then uh, you can do a, do a uh, derivative to check that. You can check over here or, or check over here. Doesn't matter because this one and that one is equivalent. This one actually is the taking the square, uh, square root, right? So uh, let's, if we check this one, this one is coming from this, this equation, right? This one, we take a square and then take a square root. So, so instead of doing all this process, we go back to this equation and check this one. Okay, so we take the y sub x here, which is taking the derivative with this one with respect to x. So you have c sub one, cinch, x minus x c, divided by c one, and take the derivative over this one, you get one over c one. So cancel with that. That will give you cinch, just a cinch function. So one plus y x square would be one plus cinch. Yeah. And then you multiply, uh, take, the, take the square root, right? Take the square root. But this one is coming from here. So one plus C square, if you get your cos square, right? So this is cos square x minus x zero over C one. All right, so that's this, that's this part. Now take the square root and multiply by C1, assuming you take the positive square root. Of course, it's always positive. So take the square root is okay. So, so Y would be C sub one. Gosh. But this is exactly this one. So you check this is correct. Okay, now you have the solution. The general form of the solution. Okay. The rest will be to substitute into the coordinate. So uh, um, we do it here. I mean, you don't have to do it. You just see that uh, you can solve for your solution this way. So this is your general solution. So the condition to solve for your two parameters, C1 and the X0, right? You need to solve this. So basically like Y1, take C1, cos X1 minus X0 over C sub one, and the X Y2 equals a C sub two, a C sub one, cos, X2 minus X0 divided by C sub one. Okay, so this, these are the two conditions that allowed you to solve for the two parameters, C sub one and X sub zero. Okay, that's the general argument. Although to, to solve it, you see that it's, a, it's not a explicit solution. 
is uh, you will get the implicit solution out and uh, most likely you, you need the numerical solution. Okay, so, uh, so that is the, the process of the, so I, so because of that, we will not write down what the functional form of C sub one or X sub zero in terms of X one, X two, Y one, Y two, because uh, you actually cannot write it, write it down in the explicit form. You just say that you need to solve these two parameters based on these two equation. Okay, so that's the idea. So basically up to here, you solve the whole problem, but uh, it's still subject to the examination, whether this is actually a minimum or maximum or whatever, maybe neither maximum or minimum, whether this is actually a valid solution, you still need to examine the, your, your situation. So that's the general case of optimization. So most op optimization problem, you, once you solve this, like a, a simple DFD x equals zero, whatever the extremal value you get, you need to go back to the situation to test whether the, that is a maximum or minimum. For a simple function, you can do a second derivatives and see whether it's positive or negative or zero, right? But uh, for a functional, the second derivative might be a little difficult to get. So usually, I mean, although you can do that, but uh, it's not uh, usually do. Sometimes you just examine it uh, by uh, by consider considering the specific situation, see whether this is uh, maximum or not a solution at all. Okay, so that's what we can do. But to do that, we can simplify the situation a little bit because uh, for this case, it's a little bit uh, asymmetry. Asymmetric this is a general case, you know, x1, y1, x2, y2. To make it uh, symmetric, you want to simplify that. Uh, basically, I may, I may be using a different notation than the textbook, but let's forget about uh, this x sub c. You actually, in your textbook, you choose x2, y2 as your x0, and whatever that that uh, condition, uh, you actually choose y one as one. You can simplify that. This is, so, I mean, doesn't matter is a scale. This is, this one is just the scale of your problem because uh, obviously you have one free scale that you can uh, scale up or scale down the whole problem and put that the second one into a symmetric. Location minus x zero one, so the two circle now becomes identical, okay, and then uh, symmetrically uh, that the two circle uh, putting in symmetric uh, location with respect to the origin zero zero, okay. So that simplifies this equ equation a lot. So in that case, uh, you can forget about this x zero. So let's just write out in a Corresponding situation, you have one equals the C sub one cause because of this symmetric situation, obviously this, this term is zero. So it should be just X. This is, this becomes our X of zero. C sub one. And that's it. Then the solution will be this one, Y equals to C sub one cos x over C sub one. And so that is uh, that is a solution, and that is has to go through this point, so that the one is equals to when you substitute x equals x zero, you satisfy this equal. Okay, so by uh, putting it in symmetric location, and then the Put it the two circle to be identical. You simplify the solution to this, this two form, so it's easier to analyze. Although the, the general situation, uh, the some of those consideration we still valid for the general situation, but the, we, but this one you simplify the, the discussion a little bit. Okay, now let's uh, erase something. 
which of all this. Now the consideration is that uh, for this equation, uh, obviously the solution of, of uh, C sub one would depends on your, your given X sub, C, X sub C, which is the location. Okay, these are the given, given points. Okay, to just a qualitative discuss that you can take the limit of X sub zero to zero. You can take the, basically you have two ranges very close to each other. So, okay, okay. so all the situation here. So you have two very identical ring, very close to each other. Okay, so you have a frame in between the two ring. So the location will be X zero and minus X zero. Okay, you understand the situation, right? So obviously one solution would be just like a straight line connecting to the two rings. So you put, just pull the two ring a little bit off. So the area will be just this strip, right? Just uh, whatever the radius times, uh, I mean that this area of the circle, I mean this circumference of the circle multiplied by this two X zero would be your, your area. That quite obvious. So, but uh, this is your y x, uh, y as a function of x, right? In that case, obviously, y will be simply a constant equals to one, right? When x zero is going to be zero, y should be, should be goes to one, right? And to get the, so uh, to get to y equals to one over the over a small distance, cost function if if uh, for a small argument, cost is just one, right? In order that y is close to one, you have c one close to one. So one solution will be c one close to one. That's why it does. So one solution is c one close to one, right? Because uh, if you go to this equation, this there will be one solution. This is a implicit equation. You need to solve for C sub one given by this equation. But one solution will be C one very close to one when X zero goes to zero. Because when X zero goes to zero divided by one, the cost function is about one. This is about one, so you satisfy the equation. But that is not the only solution. I'm about out of time. This is just illustrate. You have two, two solutions. The second solution will be uh, y sub one. That is uh, going to be very small. So c sub one goes to uh, zero. Uh, so, so when c sub one goes to zero, that it actually faster than x sub one goes to zero. This cost function becomes very large. So cost becomes large because uh, you know the cost cost function is something like that, right? Yeah. This is one, right? It's exponentially large when you have a large argument, but then you multiply by C1 and you C1 goes to zero, but C1 cost is going to one. This is going to zero, this is going to infinity. This multiplied by that can goes to a constant. So you have a second solution, okay? And so you can do it graphically and convince yourself that there's, there's a two solution. So in this case, the Y uh, function, it looks like this one. It just looks like the cost function, but they squeeze it out. So squeeze the, the cost function this way, so that it connect to these two points, right? And so the area between the sub the subframe area, it looks like there are two frames that's covered with two circles, right? So 
so that the area goes to whatever the this is the radius one way the second frame is two pi right and then you have a uh, two two circle the area will go to four pi independent of x zero the x zero go to zero obviously this one is very large as compared with this the first case the first case uh the c1 goes to one like as like what we said this is just uh x zero so but this one area goes to just uh, two pi times uh, two x zero so four pi x zero and this goes to zero and this one is not going to zero right so you have two two solutions so although the you get these two condition when you solve it although one solution is like that is not the and clearly it's not the, the minimum situation okay and further study was showing that this is not a a, a, a maximum and it's not a minimum so this corresponds to the max uh, minimum case this is not corresponding to the minimum case you actually have a two solution i'm out of time so the this two solution are presented in the figure 22.6 so the upper value is uh, this case case two the lower curve is this so-called the uh, deep curve is this one the shallow curve is the case one so shallow curve is uh, the area is going from zero as a function x sub zero this is start from zero and linearly proportional x sub zero first and this one start with uh, just uh, why is it four pi? Uh, I don't know. Uh, four pi. What is four pi? Pi is three. Uh, I mean the the area doesn't seem like my. I uh, it's. I uh, guess it's, uh, well, anyway, so, but uh, this, maybe we might have a factor of two different from the convention in your, in your textbook, but uh, this is the, just to illustrate that uh, once you get the solution, you need to examine the, the situation to see whether it's actually a minimum. So you need to do a, analysis and sometimes the the second part will be more difficult than the first part you, once you get the solution mathematically you need to go back to the physical situation and analyze it to see whether it's really a minimum or maximum okay but uh, we'll we'll stop here any questions so, because I'm out of time. so we'll continue on the other section so this then more analysis of the supreme situation also in the exercise also but uh, we'll not continue we'll, we'll move on other topic okay all right so continue on friday